Yeah, you know, I don't think there's going to be a lot of jokes in this one, but I'll try my best. Hello, I'm Eric Chow, and this is the Behind the Million for Outrospective. So yeah, this is kind of the song that the whole album has kind of been building up to, and uh, I think depending on the day, I might love the other songs more, and I might listen to them more often, but... Um, I was just the conscious of like what I'm putting out into the world with my art and just in general. And I like to think that uh, maybe this song could bring some positive changes in people or uh, kind of make them feel less alone in whatever they're going through. And um, I think it's pretty obvious what it's about. Uh, it's about kind of losing someone. And uh, after that happens, realizing like the empty space that now exists without them and how it's going to stay like that forever. And it's also kind of about like the roller coaster of emotions, five stages of grief kind of stuff that you tend to go through when you're trying to make peace with something like that. Um, especially if it's like a death that is self-inflicted. And um, I've actually been very blessed um, and fortunate at this point in my life that I've never had to deal with like the, the passing of someone that was really close to me, either as a friend or a family member. But um, obviously it's going to happen eventually. And um, I think that was the main idea that I also wanted to write about how I think it's just human nature for us to learn lessons the hard way. And I'm like 100% definitely guilty of this as well, where, you know, I don't begin to appreciate things or human beings even until they're taken away. And um, I would hope that through taking the song in and like reflecting on the creative process of making it and uh, just letting it sit with me, I and like other people can hopefully like circumvent that and you know we won't have to learn that lesson specifically the hard way you know what I mean like we can say things you want to say to people while they're still here and we can give people their flowers while they can still smell them because you know when you hear people talk about suicide or the death of a loved one in general uh, the silver lining of it is that it makes you so much more grateful for for living and all the relationships you have with the loved ones in your life become so much more real and so much more deep and genuine and open. And, you know, maybe the tough conversations that you avoided before you have now because you realize the ramifications of not doing so. And I just think it'd be great if we could, like, get to that without the middle bit, you know what I mean? You know, because you don't want to be racking your brain sitting there thinking, like, God, I hope this person knew how much they meant to me and how much I cared about them. Um, and I think once something gets repeated enough times, it doesn't resonate anymore. But, um, you know, you just never know when someone could be here every day, all the time. And, you know, one day they're just not anymore. And, um, and maybe, you know, if we told people how much we love them and cared about them before they died, then maybe some of them would still be here. And another thing that um, wasn't intentional, but uh, once I realized it, I definitely like honed in on it a lot more was that um, like the whole album and specifically like how the songs are ordered can kind of mirror the journey of an artist or like how a lot of their general lifespans can look like from bookend to bookend. And, yeah, I think it's always so cool to just be able to tell a story within like one element of the music. And um, I think that general lifespan idea is exemplified within the actual titles of the songs and also like the album artwork that was chosen for uh, each one of them as well. So with Space Boy, that song in the narrative and in reality was very much about like trying to prove myself and um, just trying to like dip my toe into something that was only ever really a pipe dream. So in the album artwork, the astronaut is very small. It only takes up like the bottom side of the frame because that's how you feel when you're first breaking in, um, like a little guppy getting dropped into the ocean. And then with Frontman, I think that's the point in an artist's career where you kind of get a big hit and something lands commercially or critically. And, you know, in this song, there's like all this bombastic energy and there's all this like playing to the crowd and all this energy and love and adoration that, you know, if you're not used to, it can kind of go to your head a little bit. And, you know, all these arrogant and egotistical tendencies can start coming up if you're not careful. So in the artwork, the Jabberwocky takes up like the entire frame just with this full body. So we're like tiptoeing closer and closer to the idea of self-obsession. And then with the protagonist, since um, entertainment as an industry is so fickle, 
and you know you might be like the flavor of the month right now but um if you like take your foot off the gas or step off the treadmill for even just a second you could like lose it entirely so as much as that song was about like wanting to be loved and prioritized by a human being i think it could also apply to like wanting to get back to becoming a favorite of the industry and you know i think a lot of artists can kind of reach a height early on in their career and you know they might spend years or their entire lives just trying to get back to that and trying to feel the same adoration that they once felt um but unfortunately a lot of them don't like reach the same heights that they used to and the album artwork reflects that idea by having just the face sick of the entire frame um because in that moment it's like the peak of self-indulgence and self-obsession you know you're obsessing over your failures and you're obsessing over your successes and uh you're kind of like monitoring all these statistics and shit like that and i think with retrospective that's the point um in everybody's lives like artists or not where you kind of make peace with it and you let go of thinking about yourself so much and you know your goals and what you care about most shifts away from yourself and more towards the people who rely on you and the people you want to provide for and you know your connection to other people and kind of what legacy you want to leave behind so in the album artwork there's no human subject at all this time um it's a bit hard to see but there's like a bit of lightning poking through some clouds it's kind of like a last prevailing message from a loved one who passed away and then with like the actual titles of the songs themselves um space boy frontman the protagonist they're all kind of like titles or monikers you could like assign to people um whereas retrospective is like not a proper noun or it's not even a word but um it's not something you like you could accurately call somebody so i think yeah it's just once again about shedding the idea of focusing just on yourself and more about providing for other people and you know just letting go of that um the individuality i guess because i think like with performers there's no better example of someone being an emotional and social chameleon because you know that entire vocation is designed around pleasing people so i think you're always like fine tuning your personality towards whatever environment you're in and what you think people want from you so i think after a while there's inevitably going to be like a, a tremendous loss of like identity and you know if you're on the hamster wheel long enough you might find yourself like wondering who you even are um because you've been basing your self-worth and self-esteem on the opinions of other people for so long looking in the mirror picking out my favorite black suit look around no you never be in back soon which you wear in police fifty in the afterlife got to cut the camera stick a picture from your better side so i think with this song i definitely want to try doing like some more visual lyrics like stuff that really like paints a mental picture for people um because i think the story and the message of the overall song just hits a lot harder when you visualize yourself um in the environment that the song talks about and looking in the mirror as a lyric just refers back to shedding that self obsession but it also touches on my own personal hypocrisy of you know not practicing the things that i preach where you know there's definitely more opportunities for gratitude in my life than i take and um you know i think just having that as a first lyric reinforces the idea that you know being grateful for people and telling the people i love that i care about them is something that i still need to work on and something that i need to remind myself to do as well so many stories that i heard before but if you hear it tell me i'll be on the floor i can't deny i miss a little demon proper sun raise the smile still be beaming so i think like one of the few bright spots of funerals is you know you get the opportunity to trade memories and stories with people but um obviously that always pales in comparison to just having the actual person you're reminiscing about there with you and despite saying um i can't deny i think if you are somebody who believes in the five specifically ordered stages of grief i think in this point of the song we're still very much in that denial stage you know we're just still in shock of whatever happening happening and you know the lyrics um miss a little demon and proper sun raised i just wanted to kind of exemplify both of the traditional ideas of the afterlife like heaven and hell with the you know beaming smile sun rays coming through the sky and um the little demon and then sun rays also harkens back to a line in space boy uh where it goes here me must sun earth revolves around him so i thought it was just a little cool callback to do um in the last song of the album like referencing the first one 
And getting to talk about the weather as well leads to the next lyric, which is um, one of my personal favorites, I think. Sky is overcast, fallacy is pathetic. I try to mental math, but it's all arithmetic. It's gonna hit real soon, right up here in my chest. Try to process the procession, hope and peace you will rest. Uh. Pathetic fallacy, I believe, is the, uh, the literary term for when the weather in a story reflects like the mood of whatever's going on in the story. And um, you know, at every funeral I've ever been to, it's always been like overcast sky. It always felt like Mother Nature like knew what was going on that day. There's like this heaviness in the air almost. And then with the try to mental math, but it's all arithmetic. I feel like when someone passes away or takes their own life, there's like a lot of these mental gymnastics that people do. Like, oh my God, I can't believe this person would do this. This person had no reason to feel the way that they did. But um, I think if we take a step back and look at people's lives, like honestly on paper, it can be a lot more simple than we make it out to be. If the person doesn't feel like, you know, they have basic human needs met, or they don't feel like there's stuff to look forward to, or they don't feel like they matter, or they feel disposable, then like, of course, then that's kind of the road they're going to go down. But I think it's easier for us to kind of ignore those things or pretend that they don't exist because it sort of like absolves us of any personal responsibility. Because um, I think you don't necessarily like want to believe that there are things you could have done to prevent it from happening. And instead we can just like, you know, exist in the shock of like, oh my God, I can't think of why they would do this or I can't believe they thought the way they did or I can't believe they felt that way. When sometimes, you know, we can believe it. And, um, you know, the drives to funerals or if you've ever been like in a funeral procession, it's a very surreal experience as well where, you know, it just feels like everyone in the car is just in their own little bubble and you're just reminiscing on your own personal experiences with the, uh, the specific person that uh, brought you all together. With your laugh, everyone would try to harmonize Silent car ride by the past we are hypnotized Journey ends for another just to take a pause At a loss, try to pick the pieces It's a thesis we gon' be alright You know, I think it is a shame with how like on the go And hustle and bustle everything is Where it feels like the only time where it's allowed Or socially acceptable for you to press pause On your life for a second Is when the life of someone you love like ended completely and, um, you know, even then, I feel like there's only like a specific like window of time where grief is met with empathy, um, because after a while, people are going to kind of tap you on the shoulder and take you aside and go, you know, all right, man, it's been, you know, X amount of days, weeks or months. It's time to get back on the horse and get over it um, when, you know, like people in that actual situation know for a fact that that's not exactly how it works. You know what I mean? Celebrate your life and hoping that you woke up from your nightmare here tonight Gonna stand straight and eulogize, try to reminisce on all them better times Still daylight, I ain't never seen them like this Parents in my mind just as I type this, they still try To hold on to the memory, hoping they won't have to do it separately I think I would say the meme of, you know, when I kill myself but mom would be sad Is uh, definitely like a certified hood classic to me um, Something that definitely rings true and I think, uh, you know, one of the biggest cruelties of life is when parents outlive their children. I don't know, it just seems so backwards, obviously, of how life is supposed to be. But um, that's just reality for a lot of people. And, um, you know, sometimes the pain of that can be too much for two people to bear together sometimes. Got a phone a friend trying to drink up all this Casparade. I must be mistaken, this a masquerade. It's funny how people speak about you dead and gone. When you said I love you, they look at you like you said it wrong. But now they truly meant it all along. Put a picture in their house, write a letter, pen a song. What was the love when you used to stay up down and breathe and trade on all the likes in the world for a simple feeling? So I think with the second verse of the song, we definitely shift gears more towards the, uh, the anger stage of grief and, um, I think that's something that always makes me do the side eye is, uh, you know, when someone passed away and suddenly like all these people come out of the woodwork and they go, oh my God, I was so close to this person. I'm going to miss them so much. Their death affects me so much. I checked in on them every day when the people who are like legitimately close to that person, like know that that's not true. And you know, you might show all the support and love online 
or you might dedicate things to them or you might write songs about them but um in reality you didn't show them the love and support when they they really needed it which is when they were alive and um i personally have always loved the word masquerade and uh kind of when i have a specific word in mind i literally go through the alphabet one by one to see if like there's a good rhyme that matches with it and um literally third letter was casperade and um it kind of refers to like you know when you seek guidance from a loved one that passed away it's like you're you're phoning like a friendly ghost like a uh, casper flowers they've escaped with the flowers on your grave smiling in a wave every mess you got it saved i mistake my claim an obituary odyssey crossing every name they're the reason that i'm gonna see a fresh empty seed at the time and home Family's always asking why was he so alone But loving friend and brother never picked up the phone They got each and every lie up their ash and stone But we gon' be alright Ever since I was a kid I always had this like romanticized idea Of what I wanted retirement to look like um, I just imagined it as like all my friends Together like just playing board games and video games And like backgammon for the rest of our lives It's actually hilarious I'm like 8 years old at this point thinking about this never joined the workforce and I'm already like, I've had enough. But then obviously like the, the heartbreaking part of that idea is the, the fact that you're gonna lose so many loved ones as you grow older. So, you know, it's just more and more empty seats at the game table, you know what I mean? And then with the lyric about um, the epitaphs, the, the writing on people's um, tombstones, I do wonder sometimes like if the people who those words are dedicated to would approve of what was written about them. You know, because it's always like beloved wife or husband or father or aunt or uncle. And, um, you know, if it's a death that's by suicide, I wonder if those people would like scoff at those remarks or, you know, laugh at how inaccurate they perceive it to be. I shout out all these mannequins, battle everyone to get you back again. Yes, I'm fine. They dig up on your heart and go, probably gonna ask me how this rug is sold. Battle Everyone to Get You Back Again was a, a reference to, I don't know if anyone remembers uh, Bakugan Battle Brawlers, they're like these little ball things, and then there's like a little magnet at the bottom, and you know in the package they come with like these, these cards, and then they have a magnet on there too, so when you throw the ball down, and the magnet hits the other magnet, the ball opens up into like this dragon or some shit. Take turns setting gate cards on the field just like this, in any order and position you want. Then, both of you choose a Bakugan to roll. At the count of three, shout Bakugan Brawl and roll at the gate cards. This is before cell phones, by the way. You know, you just be sitting there with your sad little magnets pushing it together as you're waiting for your fucking eye doctor appointment. And you know, the other two lines are kind of about the rare instances where someone tries to profit off of someone's death, which is like, you know, one of the most despicable things you could do to somebody. Chase that high, go and tattoo your initials, but they know the friendship artificial, it's not right. They prey up on the precipice, but this ain't no business or religion. Sometimes when people extend their condolences to you out of like seemingly obligation, um, there can be like this aura of like superiority that comes with it, almost like they're sticking their nose at you. You know, I don't even know if that's true, to be honest. I think sometimes if you like made your mind up about somebody, any form of like reaching out or like good deed that they're doing, you can like misconstrue it in your own brain to like fit your narrative. No one knew about your feelings, you would cover them up. No one knew about the rain, all the knives and the cuts. No one knew about your health, it was never abrupt. No one knew about your struggle, you would suffer in dust. What if I told you that I need you all the secretive stuff? What if I told you that your best, it was always enough? What if I told you that I miss you, would you send from above? What if I told you that I love you, it was never a bluff? I just can't be all right. So I think this would be like the bargaining stage of grief where you know, you're trying to rationalize it in your brain like, what you could have done to prevent something or even like negotiating with like a higher power of what you could do now to get them back. And yeah, I think it's like totally natural to almost like wanting to get into the head of the person who passed away and kind of like think and feel everything that they were going through um, at the time. And um, also to like obsess over the guilt of like not doing more or not knowing how like important you could have been in that moment. 
Cause anywhere I see you now, turn the soul curse into a hand me down. I still cry. Every time I hear your name, every time we hear you, you know it's not the same one last time. I'm living life in monochrome. Wish I would've told you you were not alone. Say it twice. I love you till my times do. Know that I'll never forget you. So I think with the last chorus, we're like undeniably settled into like the depression stage of grief. And um, I think you could argue that like the last few lines kind of indicate some semblance of moving on to the acceptance stage, but um, it's not a hundred percent, definitely. And you know, I think it is very cute to kind of put grief into these like five specifically ordered stages, but um, just like most things in reality, it doesn't really work that way. You know, I feel like you're just always perpetually like fluctuating between the first four for the rest of your life and you don't ever really get to that acceptance stage, not at least until like much later on. And, um, you know, if ever, I think, uh, living life in monochrome was a really special lyric to me because, um, you know, the album being called chameleon and all the designs and everything is so color based. And, um, I think it's really cool to be able to tell stories through color and, uh, obviously like the absence of it or like when it slowly fades away or comes back in, um, has a lot of like symbolism as well. And I remember when I was first like structuring the song, um, because this was the second instrumental I've ever done, um, after Frontman, I remember there was so much like internal debate within myself of like, you know, how many courses do I want? Do I even want a course at all? If I do do a course, like how long should it be? How long should I leave like the last piano note linger for? And yeah, there was like so much experimentation of like different drum patterns and different like piano loops and different song structures. But um, once we landed on the one that we have now and uh, it got us close to the time code of 321, I was just like, okay, that's the one I think because it just seems so fitting to have that like literal countdown within the time code of the song. It just seemed like another allegory for death in a way. So yeah, it was just like another movie script for people, a little happy accident that uh, I love so much. Okay, so that was my Nick Million for Outrospective, the last one of the album, which is uh, pretty crazy to say out loud, actually. You know, I feel like calling this a dream come true would still be like underselling it, honestly. Because I remember in elementary school, we had music class and I was so fucking bad. I played the clarinet at the time because on the day we were picking instruments, I remember I zoned out and the teacher called my name and I was like, what? And then I turned around and all the cool instruments were already gone. And I'd be sitting in class and then the teacher would like make the space and she'd be like, okay, somebody sounds off in the clarinet section. And she would solo us off. She'd be like, okay, you play. No, it's not you. You play. No, it's not you. And dude, it was always fucking me. Every fucking time. And I was so fucking bad that I literally got demoted from the clarinet to the bells, like the, the big xylophone thing where they literally have the names of the notes you're meant to play inscribed on the fucking keys. So she'd be like, okay, Eric, play a C. And I'd look for a C and I'd fucking hit that bitch, you know what I mean? So if I can go from that to having this little mini album that I wrote myself and that I'm super duper duper proud of. Then if there's something that you've always wanted to do or something that you never thought you'd be good enough for, if I can do this, then you definitely can. Granted, I don't fucking play the clarinet or the bells on any song on this album or any instrument for that matter, which is probably for the best, but you know what I mean. All right, thank you for listening. I know this was a long one, but um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Talk to you later. I love you. Where's the button?